I'll be talking about feedback in uh, radio quiet quasars, trying to take a more observational standpoint. Um, as a way of introduction, I'll just briefly mention the things that were already discussed in detail yesterday, so I'm not going to go into, the, into any detail. So from galaxy formation standpoint, we really like the idea of quasar feedback. Um, because it is likely necessary in galaxy formation models for limiting the maximal mass of galaxies, explaining the galaxy luminosity function, for reheating intercluster medium, and for putting galaxies on black hole mass uh, velocity dispersion, as Andrew discussed um, earlier today. I will um, talk very briefly about a couple of different mechanisms that observers talk about when they talk about um, quasar feedback, um, discuss briefly the requirements of the energetics of this process. Um, then I will focus on the um, observations of radiatively driven quasar winds on galaxy wide scales. This is a topic that I've been working on. Um, there is a huge uh, amount of recent interest in this field. Uh, many different groups producing very interesting results in the last few years. And unfortunately, I won't be able to do justice to all types of observations. Um, but just to give you a flavor of what sort of things have been happening. Um, if I have time, I will briefly mention uh, observational evidence for jet-driven feedback. Um, then again, if I have time, I'll talk about which mechanism is more important in which situation. So radio quiet versus radio loud feedback. And then some recent talk about some recent work that I've been doing on the nature of the radio emission and radio quiet quasars. All right, so very briefly about the mechanism and energetics. Um, as Andrew discussed earlier, um, we like quasar feedback for galaxy formation because energy is available. Um, it, the problem is that it needs to be coupled to the gas on the galaxy-wide scales. How is the feedback initiated? We, um, in, in observational um, applications, we talk about two different mechanisms of feedback. We talk about radio quiet quasars producing radiatively driven winds, and we talk about radi ra radio loud quasars producing jet driven winds, or radio loud AGM producing jet driven winds. So, um, in terms of radiatively driven winds, um, this is a picture from a simulation by Proga et al. This is on very small scales, very close to the nucleus, just like Andrew described earlier today. Um, uh, this is the accretion disk, this is the black hole, this is the equatorial plane, um, there's a hot corona that's slowly settling in the gravitational field, and the accretion disk produces ultraviolet photons that get absorbed by the sparkly ionized gas on the interface uh, between the accretion disk and the corona. The photons produce radiation pressure that pushes gas away, accelerates the gas up to very high velocities, up to 10% of the speed of light as we saw earlier today. Now, this is on very small scales. This is only a thousand Schwarzschild radii. Then what we think happens, this thing slams into the interstellar medium of the galaxy, produces shocks, accelerates the clouds that were pre-existent, in the galaxy probably destroys some of those clouds, probably reforms some new clouds. Okay, this is an alternative scenario. This is a relativistic jet being driven into a very gas-rich um, gas galaxy. And what happens is that if the density of the galaxy is very low, then the jet can poke right through. But if the density of the gas is high, as in these simulations, the jet slams into the interstellar medium, but there is a shock over here, the jet cannot push through that, there is a backflow, the backflow fills in this very hot, very overpressured cocoon, and then you form a shock all the way around the cocoon that is now propagating into the interstellar medium. And again we have the same scenario, this is what might happen on smaller scales in the center of the galaxy, and then that produces the shock that does the same thing. Shocks that uh, shocks the low density medium, accelerates the clouds, ablates the gas, uh, the, the clouds, and so on. So both of those scenarios produce a bomb in the center of the galaxy. Um, this is a very interesting simulation, and there there are um, several different um, several different types of simulations available on this. 
which illustrates what winds do when they propagate into a clumping medium of the host galaxy. Um, the galaxy is oriented like this and it's perpendicular to the plane of the board and um, they initiate a wind um, in the host galaxy that's propagating through this clumpy, clumpy medium. Okay, and what happens is that the wind is for the paths of least resistance. So it carves these channels through the clouds, um, but once it reaches the scale height of the galaxy, it finds this one pathway which is much easier to propagate into than uh, everywhere else. So it actually produces this bubble on the side of the galaxy, and then you should be imagining a symmetric bubble on the other side of the galaxy. And of course, bubbles like that are seen in starburst galaxies, so this is a very similar uh, process in spirit. Um, what I want to point out, which is extremely important from an observational standpoint, is that these winds are very clumpy. Um, this is seen in numerical simulations, such as this snapshot of one of Phil's simulations. This is the end result of their simulation of a galaxy-rich merger, and then you see at the end of it that you see a very hot volume-filling component of the wind with clumps um, embedded in it that are also coming out. But this is also what we expect uh, from first principles when the wind is slamming into the medium, either accelerates the pre-existing clouds or perhaps reforms new clouds uh, via instabilities like Andrew discussed earlier today. So from an observational standpoint, um, this, is the key, um, this is the key piece. And um, uh, in response to Joe's question earlier today, this low density volume filling component is extremely difficult to observe. It is extremely hot, it is extremely low density. It may or may not be observable in x-rays. We're trying. It sweeps up cool gas, which should be easy to see. In yes, and I'm getting to that right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, again, um, in, terms of, um, in terms of feedback and galaxy formation, the typical efficiencies that you need are um, a few percent so a few percent of the volumetric luminosity needs to be converted to the kinetic energy of the wind. And so I will tell you in a second how that compares to um, the actual observations. Okay, observations. Um, so we've been working on this for the last several years, and we have a whole bunch of different things, but I will just describe you one, basically one paper. Um, uh, we are looking at radio quiet quasars, extremely luminous quasars at Ratchet 2.5. We're using integral field spectroscopy, meaning that we have a field of view and we obtain a spectrum at every point of the field of view. Um, we're looking at the narrow line gas. Um, so we have emission lines, we can measure Doppler effect for those, and because we have a spectrum at every point of the field of view, we have the kinematics of gas in two dimensions. Um, so we do things like typical velocities, velocity dispersions, line shapes, and so on and so forth. Um, so this was a series of papers that I wrote with a postdoc at Johns Hopkins, um, Will and Lou, and we're using Gemini Telescope, Gemini GMOS IFU, and NIFS IFU, um, and we obtain allocation through the regular uh, proposing process. Okay, um, what are the key observations? So the first thing you see is that the entire galaxy is affected by this process. So here is for scale, typical size of a galaxy on the same scale. This is a 10 kiloparsec scale bar. So those ionized nebulae extend out to about 15 um, kiloparsecs from the center, um, from the center of the um, of the galaxy. Well, on the left hand side, I'm showing the radial velocity, um, the line of sight radial velocity patterns, and you see the red blue thing. So the red stuff Sorry. is receding what from lines? you. Huh? What lines are these? This is O3, sorry. Okay. This is oxygen 3. Um, uh, the red stuff is receding, the blue stuff is approaching. An easy way to understand this is if you had a biconical outflow uh, with one side approaching you, one side receding from you, and then you're sort of tilting your view closer and closer to the axis of the outflow and opening up the angle, then you would end up with something that looks like this, which is sort of similar to uh, what we're looking at here. Um, this particular... Yeah. What's that? <laughs> I'm getting to that. Thank you. <laughs> this is not rotation because 
um, the line of sight velocity dispersion is uh, about uh, is thousands of kilometers a second, or full width at maximum is several thousand up to several thousand kilometers a second, and. There is no way that this can be confined by, by the potential well of the host galaxy. Moreover, the profiles of these lines are, show very strong blue shifted asymmetries, which is a classical signature of an outflow. If you have an outflowing gas uh, with the red shifted part, the receding part of the outflow extincted by the host galaxy, then you expect to see blue shifted asymmetries, and that's exactly what we see. Um, in terms of the... Huh? Why is the outflow velocity so small that the velocity is bridging so much? Because it's almost spherically symmetric. This, the spherical symmetry is broken just ever so slightly. So that makes it actually very annoying to do long slit spectroscopy on these objects. Uh, but um, the high velocity dispersion of these things is really the key signature. And so if you have, um, if you have a spherically symmetric wind and there is no breakage of the spherical symmetry, you are not going to see any radial velocity pattern. You're not going to see any, uh, any line of symmetries, anything. You're only going to see high line of sight um, uh, velocity dispersion. Yes? But you only see the near side in the middle? Uh, no, we see both, but the, but the symmetry is broken a little bit. So there is, there is a blue shifted asymmetry. It's not extremely strong, but it's very, you know, there is a blue wing off the line, yes. But the line profiles themselves are yes. not double peaked, right? If you um, we see both. We see, uh, we see a minority of our profiles are double peaked. Um, if you really want to see <coughs> line profiles, here are some line profiles. Those are good looking. Those are the most extreme O3 lines you've ever seen. Those of you who have looked at a lot of O3, uh, O3 profiles. All right, let me get back to this. Um, okay, so no, I do not think this is rotation. With a median out estimated outflow velocity of 800 kilometers a second, I do not think that this is rotation. All right, um, so this being clumpy gas, estimating mass and energy out, um, rate, out outflow rates is pretty difficult. Um, what we think is producing this emission is dense clouds that are embedded in this volume filling uh, volume filling wind. So we have been developing techniques to deal with this, um, to deal with this problem, and we have found some new interesting line diagnostics, uh, done some photoionization modeling. I'm not going to go into the details. This is the bottom line. Um, this is the bolometric luminosity of our quasars estimated. So you see very high values, 10 to 46, 10 to 47 arc per second. Those are basically the most luminous quasars at that redshift. These are, these are type 1 or type 2? Those are type 2s, yeah, but we've two. also done type 1s now. Um, um, so, so with IFU, it's actually not as bad as you think because um, you can pre-select a narrow range of wavelengths just focusing on the O3 line, and so the PSF is not nearly as deadly as it would have been otherwise. But for type two, yeah, exactly, yes. For type two, none of this is an issue, yes. Um, and on the y-axis, we have the kinetic energy of the outflow um, estimated using these new methods that I'm not describing. And uh, you can see that there are humongous air bars every which way. Um, but this is the this is the main point of this plot. This shows you the one percent efficiency of conversion from volumetric luminosity to the kinetic energy of the wind. Okay, and this is on very large scales. This is about at about 10, 10 kiloparsecs. So this is energy rate measured by the measured as the energy rate of the ionized gas flowing through a sphere of radius um, 10 kiloparsecs um, in the galaxy or so. Nadia, you need to say at least one word about how you get the kinetic energy. Yes. That's a very hard measurement, and you're yes. showing very small errors there. That's right. Uh, oh, yeah, those errors are those errors are um, <coughs> just the statistical errors. The no, ah, no okay. systematic right. errors right. are are shown here. But the basic uh, bottom line of the method is that we think we are detecting the transition of the clouds from ionization bounded to matter bounded. So <coughs> they um, they expand with the wind, and they become they expand. Um, in the declining pressure of the medium, and they become optically thin. And we measure helium-2 lines um, as a function of distance, and we think we are detecting this transition. And using that transition, we, we can actually, so knowing where, where, as a function of distance, this transition happens, 
helps us estimate the density of these clouds, and that, that puts points on this block. Um, here is another way of doing this. So as I talked about this, uh, winds look for the path of least resistance, and in this galaxy, it's just like in Wagner's simulation, um, you expect the winds to break out perpendicular to the galaxy plane, and this would produce the super bubbles. We have several such candidates. Um, this is one candidate, the quasars in the center, you see this X-shaped nebula, so what we think is happening perhaps is that the bubbles are expanding uh, perpendicular to the galaxy, sort of plowing the stuff as they are trying to expand, and that produces this edge brightened nebula over here. And then you can use a completely different energy estimate. It's a set of Taylor-like expansion of the bubbles, and then you can get energies um, using this completely um, different method, which also gives you a few percent of the bolometric luminosity. Also huge uncertainty. Okay, I have only a few minutes, so let's see. Um, let me tell you about some recent stuff that I've been doing on the nature of the radio emission and radio quiet quasars. So, no jets, those are radio quiet objects, but nonetheless they're not radio silent. There is a little bit of radio emission detected. Those are sort of one Milijansky radio sources in the first survey. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about the overall distribution of radio power and AGN. If you take AGN at fixed optical luminosity, for example, then the distribution of radio luminosities is very broad. There are a couple of examples. This is from Ivisage et al. Um, so cover, covering this is the logarithm of the radio to optical ratio. Um, and this, as you can see, covers many orders of magnitude. The question is, is it a smooth function or a bimodal function? And from the plot that I'm showing, you can see which camp I'm in, right? So these guys demonstrated that um, uh, there is a dip here in this distribution, while most of the sources are actually below the limit of the first survey. And so they pile in in this big peak over here. Kimball et al. actually looked and uh, went and looked at the faint sources uh, with, with deeper VLA data, and so they measured the luminosity function of the faint sources, and they also find a little bit of a dip here between the radio quiet and radio loud population. Um, why is this an important question to ask? Well, the, we know what these are. These are powerful relativistic radio jets. And so the question is, is that the same stuff just scaled down in power? Or is there a completely different physical mechanism kicking in at those low radio luminosities? So it's a very interesting question because it goes to the heart of whether or not every single supermassive black hole is actually capable of producing a collimated outflow or not. Um, so I've already showed you these, uh, um, these uh, spectra. Those are extreme um, O3 emission lines um, uh, uh, in some of the type 2 quasars. Um, so what we have found looking at the statistics of these profiles is that there is a strong correlation between the line of sight velocity dispersion of O3 emission and the radio luminosity. Okay, and these are your standard FR1, FR2 radio galaxies. They are a minority of the population. This is the scattered, you know, perhaps 10%, 5 to 10% of the points uh, in this regime. But those are the objects I'm talking about. So there is this very nice um, correlation. Um, and the dotted line actually shows you a quadratic slope. So luminosity roughly proportional to the square of the velocity dispersion, which does suggest a certain, uh, you know, constant conversion efficiency between the kinetic energy of the gas and the radio luminosity. So um, we are proposing an, a model for this correlation, so to speak, a very yes, <laughs> a very hand wavy model that the quasar-driven shocks um, propagate into the ISM of the host galaxy, accelerate particles, those particles produce uh, radio emission. This mechanism is different from the usual assumption. There are compact jets in the centers of those galaxies. And the numbers work out, and I can go into that, but I won't. So here's my summary. <coughs> um, the overall picture that we have in mind when we look at those things is that they're either radiatively driven or jet-driven winds, 
um, that propagate, when they propagate into gas-rich host galaxy, they produce shocks, um, they accelerate clouds or destroy clouds or form new clouds. So we have to find ways to observe this multi-phase uh, multi medium. Um, there is a whole slew of recent observations of galaxy-wide quasar-driven winds, including winds that are very likely um, driven by the radiation pressure of the quasar rather than by the jet. Um, and um, early indications indicate wind power of up to a few percent of the volumetric luminosity, which is definitely a number that's of interest in galaxy formation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to point out the, what you mentioned about the simulations predicting the clumpy outflows. So for that um, same simple AGN model, that's actually sensitive to numerical technique you use. Mm -hmm. So those are likely spurious, and if you use improved SPA yeah. for a different code, they, they go away. Yeah, I'm aware that, the, well, the simulations don't actually resolve the range of densities right. even that mm -hmm. are even remotely relevant for our observations. So right. the low density component doesn't go low enough and the high density component doesn't go high enough. Right. However, I will point out that if you, um, if you, you know, if you sort of forget about the definition of a cloud and if you take your numerical simulation and if you take a slice at a sort of like some, some density value and you look at the distribution of velocities um, that is associated with these higher density peaks in the numerical simulation, then you're actually getting line profiles that are quite similar to what we observe. We did this exercise. We are very interested in um, trying to do this exercise better because we've only compared with a couple of actually 2D numerical simulations. But the early results were very promising. So there's definitely interesting stuff to be done, even if the numerics is not quite there yet. <coughs> yeah, so Just from the velocity to the field. And all stuff, the, yeah. the larger scale. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <coughs> So I, this is a point that Hans Walter also made, made, I guess. When you look at winds in nearby Eulers, where we're very convinced that we're seeing a wind because you have the orientation of the galaxy, etc., there's strong evidence for double peak profiles. Yes. Right? You're observing winds that look very different from that. Right? You're not seeing clear evidence for double peak profiles. You're seeing very tiny shifts in the red and blue direction, and your whole argument for the wind is this large velocity dispersion. Do you have an idea of why your winds look so different than ones that we sort of have studied and understand? Um, the, um, there are some double peaked profiles in, in these winds, um, in, um, in quasar winds. So in Eulergs, actually, I was just looking at the sample of nearby Eulergs, and some of those profiles are extremely similar to um, the nearby Eulergs, especially the ones that host luminous quasars. Um, I wrote a paper with Matt Hill that 2014 that shows all these profiles. I mean, some of them look like twin brothers of those, and that's the bright IRAS sample, you know, Eulergs at 0 0.1, 0 0.2. The main, the main observational difference we found between local Eulergs and these Eulergs, uh, and, these, and these quasars, is the overall uh, velocity and the velocity dispersion of the outflow. Starburst-driven winds are slower by a factor of two. The typical estimated velocities for starburst-driven winds is 500 kilometers a second, and for these, 1,000. That, and there's a very strong correlation in nearby Eulergs between the velocity dispersion of the lines and the source of power as measured from SED fitting or infrared, um, various infrared diagnostics and so on. Now, I see many questions we can take. One, the others I would ask, sort them and save them for 12.30. Back then. So if you average of the lifetime of a typical supermassive black hole, is more energy deposited into ISM in the Eddington driven regime or in the jet driven regime? Um, my personal opinion is that not every black hole produces a jet. Um, so there are black holes that are incapable, in my view, in incapable of producing a jet. I was, not of attrition rate uh, no, I don't think so. And the re so I was going to talk about this, but I ran out of time. And the reason I, th I say that is that there are very interesting differences between the galaxies that host uh, radio loud objects and radio quiet objects, even at, let's say, given stellar velocity, uh, given stellar mass of the galaxy, you know, everything about the galaxy is fixed, 
but there are very interesting, um, very interesting differences which indicate to me that those are, you know, intrinsically different black holes. And I can talk about this at length, but we are out of time. So okay. <laughs> during the and break. Let's thank Nadia again.